you. Hello. Hello, interns. This is fun. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm a congressional reporter for Politico. I write the Huddle newsletter, which is our morning newsletter that is really laser focused on Capitol Hill. Um, we have so many newsletters, but they cover a broad swath of things, and I am Capitol Hill focused. Um, I've been covering Capitol Hill, Congress, and life on Capitol Hill uh, for eight to 10 years. Uh, I was an intern at CQ, roll call, uh, after my sophomore year of college uh, and really got hooked. Um, at that point, I knew I was really into politics uh, and policy, but didn't really know what my path was yet. Um, and frankly, uh, the CQ internship was paid and the internships uh, that I was looking at on Capitol Hill were not. Um, and that is how, <laughs> frankly, a big turning point in my career. Uh, after I studied political science, I didn't study journalism, came back to CQ uh, and spent eight years at CQ Roll Call uh, covering everything from committees to appropriations to, um, you know, life on Capitol Hill, staffer issues, uh, Capitol Police. Um, fun fact, Roll Call has been covering Capitol Police for decades, long before January 6th. Um, I left in July to move to Politico and try to bring that um, community sensibility uh, that I really came up with at Roll Call to Politico to uh, really put a lens on life on Capitol Hill, that mixing policy and how the institution works and kind of lifting a curtain uh, on what so many people in the U.S. think of as a, a mysterious institution made up of, you know, old men. Um, and actually young people around Capitol Hill um, from interns all the way up to chiefs of staff, um, the staff run the show. And I think it's a really interesting part of what goes on here. So thank you for that. And if you're not subscribed to Huddle um, interns uh, who are on the panel, you definitely should. Um, it's really fun. I know there are a lot of tip sheets out there. Um, Huddle is a great behind the scenes of the Hill. Um, Catherine, I think you guys do a really good job, um, and I know this is intentional, of blending both the horse race process culture of the Hill, but also the policy as well. And I think a lot of times folks lean more towards one or the other. So um, it's, a, it's a great newsletter if you're coming to the Hill for the first time. My name is Matt Cordoni. I'm currently the communications director for um, Jake Auchincloss, who is the representative from the Massachusetts 4th Congressional District. Uh, he recently took over for Congressman Kennedy. Um, previously, I'd been on the Hill um, about two and a half years ago now um, for Congressman Moulton, who's also from Massachusetts. In the interim, I've been on and off a few campaigns um, and I still do campaign work for the Congressman, as well as his leadership pack. Um, uh, my journey to Capitol Hill, um, I always like to tell people if anyone tells you they have a clear path to Capitol Hill, they're lying because it's usually some parts luck and some parts circumstance. Um, I came from a campaign, uh, and just sort of found my way here in my first job. And I've been bouncing back and forth ever since and really excited to talk to everyone about how press and communications has changed, um, over the last few years. Uh, Faith, if you'd like to go. Sure. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Faith. I am the press secretary for Representative Michelle Steele from California. Um, she is a freshman who uh, flipped a seat. So I've been with her since December when we, she was staffing up. Um, previously to that, I was with Congressman Paul Mitchell from Michigan. Um, similar to Catherine, I kind of caught the bug in an internship I was doing in college. Um, I worked at the Congressional Management Foundation, so it's actually one of the organizations that sponsors this event. They do a lot of awesome work with Congress, um, congressional offices, um, advocacy, advocacy groups as well. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I was a research assistant there for three months before my senior year of college. And at that point, when I moved out to D.C. to do that, I still was very unsure what my path post-grad was going to look like. Um, and that was a very transformative experience for me just because I learned a lot. 
Um, and I definitely caught the DC bug. Um, I would walk to Capitol Hill to run errands and was like, Oh, I want to be here. I want to be in these buildings. I want to be where these people are. It felt very exciting to me. And like everything was kind of revolving around the Hill. So that was kind of the turning point for me where I decided I wanted to go try to be a staffer, do all that fun stuff. Um, I watched a lot of, you know, West wing, uh, all those things. So I had this very cool idea of what it would be like to be a DC staffer. So then I moved back to DC after I graduated, um, got internship in a California office, uh, really kind of hit the ground running. I had about two months worth of savings in my account to get me through to get an actual staff position. Um, so that was kind of the the push behind, you know, networking like crazy, as I'm sure you guys have heard already from various workshops that that's really what kind of keeps this place running. So I was getting copies, passing my resume along to anyone who would take it and landed as a staff assistant um, and then worked my way up through comms positions ever since then. So uh, I've been on the Hill for about two and a half years now. Um, I'm excited to, to talk with you all. It doesn't look like Rachel has been able to join us um, unless I've missed her popping in. So um, so three of us can continue the conversation for now. Uh, the first uh, question was actually for me and Faith. Um, Faith, I have thoughts or have been interested to hear yours um, first about starting a freshman office and the challenges that come with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I got this position, everyone was like, this is going to be the most work you've ever done, but it's so rewarding. And they were definitely not lying. Um, a freshman office is a ton, a ton of work. Um, it's setting up things that you wouldn't even really think about or I didn't need to think about previously when you walked into a communications shop that was already set up. Um, little things down to like, what are our colors going to be? And like, what are the fonts that we want to use for graphics? And are we going to do a newsletter? How often are we going to do one? Um, what are our Facebook ads going to look like? All these like smaller things that you don't even need to really think about. I feel like when you enter into a shop that's already set up, but those are all kind of being done from scratch. Um, so a big part of, you know, setting up a freshman office is figuring out all those little details and then also trying to figure out, okay, what are my boss's main messages going to be? What are their long-term goals? That's obviously important getting to know, you know, Obviously, as a freshman, they have these lofty goals in mind, not necessarily always going to be accomplished in their first term, but how to set them up for success later on, right? So you talk to your boss and you know, okay, their goal is eventually to be on Ways and Means, and they have a background in this. We want to make sure that this first term, we're really pushing the message that, you know, all of this stuff about taxes, right? So like thinking in that strategic way of not necessarily trying to be reactive to things but proactive as much as possible is a big part of I think setting up a freshman office and having those plans in place um so that was definitely a, a big push in the first few months and then obviously had all these big plans that kind of got derailed by everything that happened at the beginning of January um so you know that was definitely I think something that was unexpected that all staff and members had to deal with but certainly for comm staff in on my, you know, beautiful communications plan that I put together for January of introducing my boss and how we're going to connect with the district because my boss had been a local representative for a year. So she had pretty good name ID in the district, but in, in a certain part, right, because it's obviously larger than her local board of supervisors was. So trying to expand that and, you know, had all these plans and then everything kind of derailed it. But that's, I think, kind of... Um, how comms goes, right? You make plans and then something happens and then, oh, we're going to reroute. So um, definitely a lot of rerouting, definitely a lot of trial by error. Um, a big thing about setting up a freshman office too is like learning how your st the style of your boss. So like I, my boss personally does not want to go on cable news every night and talk about the news of the day. Some members do, and that's great. There's not one that's right or wrong, but just learning, okay, how often does my boss want to be on TV? How often do they want to be doing interviews? What are her like bread and butter issues that she really feels comfortable talking about if I set her up with a reporter? Um, and what do I want to kind of make sure to prep her more on? So learning all of these things and that comes with, you know, both starting with a new member that you're working for and setting up a freshman office, especially because you're like their day one person, right? Like you are their go-to. If you leave after them, everything's kind of going to be compared to what you did and how you set them up. And you want to make sure you're setting them up for success and setting them up to, you know, achieve their goals that they have for their first term and beyond. So Definitely a ton of work. Um, it's been really rewarding. I feel like I just got a chance to breathe about a month ago in August. I feel like it was my first time that I was actually like, okay, I don't have something to do. Because when you're in a freshman office, even when you finish one thing, there's another thing that you're like, oh, well, I could be doing this. I could be organizing this, you know? So 
always something to do. It's been very rewarding, but lots and lots of work. Yeah. And I would just echo that with, you know, there are a lot of things that you think the last time I was on the Hill, you walk into a fully functioning mail program and a website that already exists. This was a lot of trying to design a website in December before you even had access to your email. Um, and there's always fun rules and technicalities about the last member's website being archived at noon on swearing in day and yours going live and all the stuff about that. Um, and also I think the pandemic made it very interesting for freshmen. Um, you know, usually there are a lot of really nice um, swearing in events. You can invite constituents to an open house at the, at your office. You can have full family member on the floor with you. You don't need to be on the floor with a mask. You get your speaker's photo. Um, you know, this, this Congress, my boss and his dad Ubered to the Capitol by themselves our office had no furniture and, you know, you were only allowed on the floor in groups of like six or seven. Um, so this Congress in particular has been interesting to open a freshman office and the pandemic provides its own virtual constraints. Um, I will say the other thing about a freshman office is in addition to setting up your comp shop and all the, you know, the trials and tribulations that come with that, uh, in addition to the pandemic, um, you're really teaching a freshman member how DC works and how Congress works and at the same time, you're trying to introduce reporters to your member. Um, a lot of, you know, press in D.C. is relationship based. Um, if I know you, I know your district, I know your backstory, what you're interested in. and I see you coming out of votes. Then I want to talk to you and grab you for quotes. Um, so this has been both fun and challenging. Um, challenging because of the pandemic and how off the record meetings were happening and how votes were happening and you know, after the insurrection, the access that different folks had to the chamber at different times, um, sort of introducing the congressman to people and starting to build up that network, which is such a big part of your job. Um, and uh, it's something you take for granted. I think, like they said, you come into an established member who has press relationships already. Um, it's it's a big and, and big and fun part of it. Um, and the pandemic made it all the more interesting. Um, and so, Catherine, I wanted to, you know, kick it to you to say, you know, hear your perspective on this. Um, Faith and I spend a lot of time sending pitches and trying to introduce you to our bosses and things like that. So um, you just want to talk about it from the reporter side of what's interesting, how you like meeting members and sort of, you know, the reporter vibe on that. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to speak to like not this year because I know you guys just live this year along with me, but it was completely different and this year's freshman class probably had one of the most um singular experiences um it's not the norm uh meeting freshmen in a regular year uh it really is about staff um and like initiative in terms of getting you know what is the relevancy of this member because Frankly, uh, from a policy standpoint, your freshman members are not senior, have seen, having seniority on a committee. They are not, um, you know, they, one might be in a quasi leadership role in the caucus, like representing the freshman class, basically. Um, but, but there are policy issues across the board that these members are involved in. And I think that is where like hitting your spots as comms people um, is, can be the most effective, you know, okay, your freshman member might not be like the pivotal voice on this on the floor. They're not going to lead the bill on the floor when it gets there probably. But if there's a tie in that makes them either in their background, were they involved in the industry or did they regulate this previously on the local level or what unique or like special experience or context? Do they have the largest X, Y, and Z in their district? So even though they're not, you know, their name is at the top of the legislation, they're having input because it's their district. That's where I see like the biggest opportunities for freshmen you every freshman class will have um i don't know what you call them kind of the media darlings um 
I mean, you can probably think of them like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, hands down, got more press attention <laughs> than any other member of that class. Um, and it's a larger conversation, I think, about why those narratives develop. Um, I think that if your boss doesn't want to be on CNN every night, doesn't want to be on Fox every night, um, but is really into an issue, I think one of the best ways to connect and bring a voice to your member can be not necessarily seeking out the names that you know from TV or from the top headlines um, in the big national papers, but trade publications, sorry about the helicopter. Um, you know, there are trade publications and uh, specific people, reporters all across the hill on hyper specific beats, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's um, energy regulation or whatever. Um, reaching out to those folks, one, you never know where those folks are going to end up. Um, I started behind the, my work was behind the paywall for years. And now I have a much wider audience and I've kept a lot of those relationships um, from my committee days. And you never know where your boss is going to end up. Your boss could be chairman of that committee someday and developing those relationships with reporters who might not have the splashiest place for your boss's name to go, but allows you to highlight their issue. That's like my take, uh, having been in a wonky, wonky policy place and for a broader audience. That's where how I'm looking at freshmen these days. Awesome. And I saw that Rachel has made it in. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Hi, everyone. Apologies for the lateness. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to start and talk about um, sort of your role now, uh, your past role, and sort of how that fits into the, the process as well, and introduce yourself. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Rachel Oswald. I'm a Capitol Hill reporter uh, covering uh, foreign policy issues from a congressional perspective for CQ Roll Call. So I know KTM very well from our years together working at CQ. Um, can't speak highly enough of her and I uh, would underline every single thing she has said. It's really good advice. Um, uh, I'm also here today in my capacity as the 2021 chairperson of the Standing Committee of Correspondents. Um, uh, to be a little bit nerdy, um, there are, there are, there are thousands of credentialed reporters on Capitol Hill, um, and we belong to different galleries. Um, I, um, and belong to the gallery, um, the biggest gallery for daily news reporters. So like AP, Reuters, the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, all of those big, uh, print-based news agencies will be under that gallery, but then there's also the periodicals gallery, which uh, KTM is a member of. Um, and then there is a gallery for TV and radio journalists. Um, so CNN and Fox will be credentialed under there. And then their fourth gallery is for photographers. So that's probably more information than you need to know. But um, what I can talk to you about what what our galleries do um, and the four galleries like to basically work together. Our interests are pretty much aligned. We advocate for as much ad access as we can get for the credential press corps on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, uh, all of us, in order to be have the permanent press badge, we do have to pass. We are vetted. Our news organizations are vetted. Our news organizations are um, determined to be bona fide journalism organizations. Um, so, like, there are there are those built in background checks. So. Because of that, we argue that, you know, we should be allowed to go places where the public aren't allowed to go, um, you know, where especially lobbyists aren't generally allowed to go, like the speaker's lobby in the House um, is, is actually a really great place to stake out lawmakers. Um, we also uh, credential reporters, um, you know, when people apply to be credentialed, they apply to one of those four galleries. Um, so we're self, we're essentially self-governing bodies. Um, there's been a long-standing agreement between journalists and the House and the Senate that you know a free press is important, you know, and a free press is good as a watchdog for democracy, um, and also that it's not a good look to have Congress just saying who can be who can have the press badge, who can come into Capitol Hill. 
So what has what the solution that has been working, I think, pretty well for decades is journalists look at other journalists who are applying for credentials and we kind of do check to confirm that they are, in fact, journalists and not, say, lobbyists. Um, that they are not um, foreign agents, you know, that's become a thing recently. Um, and so so that's how we work through that. Um, and we also represent um, the interests of journalists during things like COVID. You know, um, we actually took a lot of, we, the press corps, organized ourselves to lower our numbers um, during the pandemic. So there was really just a fraction of our normal members while sharing cooperatively um, audio interviews amongst ourselves so reporters wouldn't necessarily feel feel the need to go to the Capitol. And then just to wrap it up, another issue that we've been dealing with recently is security, unfortunately. After the January 6th insurrection, and as KTM has so ably reported, a lot of things are brought to light. Um, and so one thing going forward is we, the press, want to make sure that we're aware of security threats to the Capitol, even if they're not for reporting, you know, just heads up. Hey, there is activity going on in this corner of the Capitol grounds. We advise our members to avoid it, you know, um, take the tunnels today. That's the kind of thing. So we're a little bit kind of like a labor advocacy group, a little bit on the Hill. We, we advocate for access, public safety and security and professionalism. And that, that's it. Awesome. Thanks. Um, we're starting to get some questions in the, in the, the chat. Um, I know we wrap up around five till. Um, so if you want to start to throw some questions in there, I think we'll each do um, another round of comments and then we'll move on to the questions. So uh, the next queue is for Rachel and Catherine. And it's, you know, I think a lot of the folks on this Zoom, when they're roped into um, some comms work in their offices as interns, but one of the things that inter that you know, comms directors like to do to help start to teach folks press is to write some draft pitches. Um, so uh, the folks who read the pitches, you know, what do you think makes for a successful pitch? I addressed this a little bit earlier, but I think, um, one, I don't frankly know how long it takes to write a pitch, but you should maybe spend that amount of time also deciding who to send it to. Um, some comms teams just send it to every living human being that they have an email for. Um, and I will say, if you think that I'm on every member of Congress's email list and many committees, so if everyone sends one email a day, I'm well up into the thousands. Um, th and that's not like a boast or whatever. That's just like the reality of my life is your comms team is not even close. The only email I'm getting in these five minutes. Um, so I think picking your shots is one thing. Um, and that you, whoever you are working with um, might have better tools for this. But I think looking on Twitter, looking on um, organizations, mastheads, looking where your member already has relationships, which you can do by, you know, searching where your member has already done interviews, things like that. Um, so where relationships might already be established. Um, and what's a organization or an outlet that you've been interested in and seems to be up on all these issues that your member wants to talk about. Um, I think that is part of it. I also think um, in terms of pitches, if you have, if you're talking about a letter, send me the letter. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, maybe a lot of Hill interns took AP US history. Like you want that primary source doc. You want the, what was it? The document-based essay that you had to write in AP US history that we are looking for the document. Um, yeah, we love the, your quotes that go along from your member, um, talking about this issue and highlighting, um, their role in X, Y, or Z. Um, but it's not a take your word for it kind of relationship. Um, so we want to read that letter. We want to read that amendment. We want to read that thing that someone else in your office probably spent a lot of time on. Echoing everything Catherine said, um, I got to tell you, you know, it's a fire hose of emails we get. And if you're emailing me from a member's office and you're emailing me about an issue I never, ever write about, 
frankly, it will annoy me a little bit, you know, and then I will associate, oh, annoying, annoying office with your email. So like, it, it's not fair, but like, that's how I think the human brain works. And so if you're actually trying to penetrate me, that time when you actually do have the issue that crosses my coverage area, you know, um, I would say, you know, people talk about quality versus quantity. Like I could email all these offices today and Hey, that sounds like a good number to tell my boss. I emailed hundreds of reporters today, but I would actually recommend quality. Again, what Catherine said, email, even with just half a dozen reporters, but if you know what they write about, you know, their region of focus, I do think you'll be more effective, um, in terms of like how to, how to get my attention with your pitch. Um, you know, things I'm interested in are, um, interesting bills being filed on a topical topical thing that aren't necessarily messaging bills. I mean, I know messaging bills are important, but everybody does messaging bills. Everybody does messaging, messaging bills. Um, so something that actually is trying to substantively address a problem, uh, bills that are bipartisan are more likely to get press coverage. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, so that will be more likely to, to, to catch my attention if something is bipartisan. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would leave it at that for a moment. Oh, and, um, being receptive to interview requests. Like once you actually do get the lawmaker, you, you get the reporter's attention and she wants the interview, like follow up, like don't let it go die. Make sure if you CC the scheduler and then either reporter respond, here's my availability. Make sure the scheduler is also working with us because that's sometimes where I've had any of your requests die. You know, um, the initial outreach landed, there was contact, I took the bait, and then there was no follow up from the office in time for my deadline. Oh, and that's one more thing to think about who is the outlet you're working with and what are the deadlines? You know, some outlets have minutes, days, hours, other outlets have a few days, you know? So think about that too, when you're, when you're, when you're honing your reach. Outreach. To your last point, Rachel, um, you can't dodge a reporter for nine months. And then when you have something that you want them to write, go back to them. <laughs> and so even if it's something that you don't want to weigh in on, or um, you're just not trying to go there, or you're not interested in that particular, um, you know, story, it costs nothing to be nice and pick up the phone and say, Hey, off the record, my office is staying away from this right now. Here's, I can tell you why here's someone else who might be helpful to talk to you. If you want to talk to my boss about X, Y, and Z, um, would love to make that happen. Um, or, you know, if it's something that like, it might not be a top priority for you right now, but you know, in a few months, you'll be working with this outlet, make it a priority. Um, because no one's ever going to prioritize you if you don't prioritize them. Um, to Catherine's point, I never assume that reporters see my email. So um, I will do a not aggressive, but just like a casual, hey, I shot you a note when you have a second to look at it, um, text. Um, and that goes with TV stations, especially in your districts. Um, just because you send a media advisory that your boss is going to be at a head start, don't assume it's making it on a planning calendar. Call the TV studio, local TV studio, make sure they actually put it on the planning calendar and follow up the day of to see if they're actually going to get a camera there or not. Um, you know, those are just all little tricks I've learned along the way. Um, I think, you know, like we're all people who all have a lot of things coming across our desk at the same time. Um, and just be mindful of that. And also ask yourself, is something news? If you're introducing a bill and you send it out in press release form to every reporter on your list, um, that's not news. That's everyone getting a piece of information at the same time. And if it's um, just um, a bill that's not something that's newsworthy that day, um, you know, don't expect to get a clip off of it. So if you really do want to get a clip off of it, think of, is there a reporter who would like this as an exclusive? Is this something that might make a great entry into a newsletter? Is this something that we can announce it during a visit in our district and get a local TV camera there and offer them a 10 minute pull aside afterwards? Um, so just sort of thinking about how to get that coverage in a more strategic way. Um, a lot of times working in communications, your ledge team will come up to you and say, can we send a press release? Or your district team will say, can we send a press release? Um, and I like to ask, what do you think happens when a press release gets sent? Um, because a lot of times in modern communication, it goes sort of into a void. 
Um, it's a tool. It's not the end result. And so that's how I would start to think about it as you enter your offices. Faith, I don't know if you have any tricks or things out there as well. Yeah, sorry. I think I got bumped off the Zoom for a second there. So I didn't hear exactly what you, everything you said, but I would just echo what you were saying at the end there with Ludge team wanting to send out a press release and just kind of asking, you know, what's the why behind this? Because I agree, you know, if you want that positive headline for your boss or you want that productive story you can share back home, um, it doesn't just happen naturally. And that's like part of our job as comm staffers is to, you know, put in the work, make those relationships with those reporters so that when your boss is introducing a bill or is sending a letter that you want coverage on or, you know, doing something in the district, you want to have those people that are going to write something up for you. So forming those relationships, having someone to pitch it to, like Matt said, offering an exclusive, um, those are all things that are part of our job as comms people. And, you know, I think that's something that was very, you know, after doing comms for a few months, that's something that I learned pretty quickly. It's like, oh, I can't just send this out and expect people to pick it up, right? Like, you've heard Catherine and Rachel talk about how their inboxes are full all the time. So thinking about, you know, being strategic and just echo all those points as well. I had two things. Yeah. I just like two more, like two thoughts that I have are like um, the intentionality of like who you're reaching out to, but also when reporters reach out to you, um, having, I mean, you obviously have to play defense sometimes to your boss. Sometimes your boss doesn't want to talk about things, but uh, not, not assuming the worst intentions on both sides. I'm not assuming that you know, comms people are lying to me and their boss is like probably doing legal things or anything like that. And I guess the best, some of the best relationships I have on the Hill are where the comms person and I see each other's shared humanity. Um, We both know that we're very busy. We both know that, you know, if a week is particularly crazy, I'm often in a position and have been many times in my career where like, there's huge stuff happening on Capitol Hill and I'm covering that, but I also have this question about a weird thing and acknowledging, Hey, this isn't the top of your priority list, but if you can give us like three minutes, that would be helpful. Um, and being really candid about, um, where this fits into your life, your strategy, whatever. Um, I think also, especially with what I was talking about before with the, um, like wonky policy focused outlets policy is hard and often a press release even a great a plus press release is not gonna answer all the questions that um someone who has focused on this topic for a living for a decade has and so being willing to say can i put our policy person on the phone with you and me, um, you know, a lot of policy staff don't want to get on the phone with press in my experience without a little bit of a backstop of the comms team. Um, and frankly, just understanding what that amendment that your boss is so passionate about and you really want to see get passed on the floor. We literally aren't going to write about it if we can't explain it to our readers and, um, if the legislative language just points to like 12 other statutes, it would be so much easier if we could have a seven minute phone conversation where you walk a reporter through it um, and walk them through what the thing would do and why it matters um, or have a policy person do that with you on the call. Um, We're not just asking for nitty gritty policy details, like for kicks we're just not going to write about your amendment if we can't explain it. And that's kind of the name of the game. One last round for us, and then we'll go to the chat Q and a, but I really enjoyed this um, question that was proposed to us um, to think about as a panel. Um, It's sort of an existential one of what would you change (laughs) about DC media if you could. Um, So Faith, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I thought this question was interesting. So I was like, okay, where do I even start? There's like so many things we can talk about, right? Um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, you know, kind of this goes back to something we kind of touched on earlier um, about, you know, there are certain members who are always going to get attention, right? Like there are certain members who like to, you know, throw bombs out there, throw things that they're going to say outrageous things and or they'll get picked up. 
Um, and that's just the nature of the, you know, 24 hour news cycle that we live in and social media and all of those different factors that uh, have created this kind of perfect storm of, you know, whoever is the loudest gets the most attention. Um, so I think that if there was one thing I guess I could change, which I don't really foresee as something that could actually be changed, but you know, there are certain, you know, rank and file members and there are a lot of, you know, Congress gets a lot of bad, you know, a bad, a bad rap, if you will, uh, about, you know, there's the stories that come out that are painting members in a bad light and all this, these things. And, um, but I think there are a lot of members who are trying to do good things and who are trying to, you know, work for their constituencies and, you know, Oftentimes, those members are not the loudest. They're not going viral. They're not going to be the first ones out there. They're not because it's it's boring, right? Like people who are just doing their their job and trying to get things done. That's not what sells. That's not what makes a good headline. That's not what gets people to click on an article. And so that's kind of just all a part of I think the media landscape we're in in general and the hyper partisanship that we see across the board. Um, but in a perfect world, I guess it would be you know members who are actually trying to get stuff done and not just, you know, throwing things out for the crazy headline or the crazy attention they get back home or to rile up their bases. I think that would be, you know, it would make our job as constable a little bit, I guess, more boring because it wouldn't be as, you know, let's see what we can get to get the most retweets today. Um, but it would be more substantive. And I think that that's something that, you know, if you're an intern and you're going into comms, you maybe think is like what it is. And sometimes it's, it's not that right. So like kind of, the rose colored glasses you have about what working in DC is like kind of come off after you've been here for a bit and you realize like, okay, that's not necessarily how it works all the time. You know, that your member just cause they're doing something great isn't going to necessarily get the attention for it because there are other things going on. And there are people who are, you know, beating the drum louder than they are about the news of the day. So that's kind of my thoughts on that, but obviously a lot of different factors there. Yeah. Um, mine, I think, um, pertains to the relationship between local outlets and Capitol Hill. Um, I'm fortunate being in the Boston media market, the Boston Globe does have a bureau in DC. Um, yes. <laughs> um, but a lot of times, um, you know, local outlets are just sort of beat on shoe leather because they're not here to hang out outside of votes or to be in person and cover the committee hearings or, they're just not staffed in a way where they can have someone watch a virtual committee hearing. Um, sometimes TV stations will pay to have, um, uh, you know, cameras come in for a day or two around big events. Um, sometimes they'll feed off of a off of a pool camera, and sometimes they just don't have the resources to do anything. So I think if I could change one thing, it would be helping local outlets understand the importance of just having boots on the ground, maybe not every day, but for major events or just occasionally. Um, and also, I think in a lot of cases, it's helping them get the resources to do that. Um, I think it's healthy to mix local and national reporters together on the Hill. It's healthy for communities to have someone in D.C. that can report back to them. Uh, and it's something that I've seen happen even less and less just over the um, seven years I've been working in comms. Um. I would say, um, I mean, my beefs, my beefs with the media, media, media sphere in DC, they're really, they're really structural. I think so many, it, it's really, it's, it's not like one thing, if I could change, it would all be, it, it, you know, it's like the, the problems are structural and they need structural solutions that basically are societal solutions. Like we need more Americans to feel comfortable paying for journalism, subscriptions. And, and right now the model we have is so eyeball focused, um, and getting people to watch your TV station or read your article. And what we know sells is things that are sensationalistic and that incentivizes lawmakers acting bombastically. You know, we, we have these terms, um, show horse, work horse that get thrown around, you know, well, the show horse on Capitol Hill is ascendant. And you can actually see it in the comms budgets. There have been studies that have been done that show that the amount of uh, the proportion of lawmakers' personal personnel budget that is devoted to comms has gone up, and that has actually come from the legislative side. So sometimes, particularly in the Senate, you'll see half a dozen people doing comms, you know, and then like three three policy issues, four policy issues, be the charge of one staffer, right? So what gets lost in that is 
you know, actual thoughtful work on solutions to help Joe Q America, right? Um, and 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 so, but the incentives again for for a show horse to kind of catapult themselves, you know, forget seniority and doing your time on the bench. You know, they could be a cabinet member in one or two terms if they play their cards right. And and the press has a role in that because we do highlight people who are media stars. And I do think that's unfortunate, but like it would take Americans, <laughs> basically like in Germany, I love Germany. Well, I love, what, what I mean by that? In Germany, the race for the prime, for the, for the German elections, the prime minister, it's all about who's the least sexy candidate for prime minister. Like the voters are like pushing for the least controversial law, like, like lawmaker they can find. Like they are so averse to grandstanding like the voters they just don't want it and I thought wouldn't that be nice to have <laughs> just a little bit more German in our media media sphere I don't know it, would, it probably wouldn't work for America no that's not gonna yeah, work German again. reporters also also have to get all their quotes from lawmakers okayed by the comm staff so I'm not here for that um, no <laughs> point but but sexiness and politics don't really go well together they don't yeah Um, I think that, yes, there's massive issues in the media industry, of course. Um, one, I try to focus on doing my job as well as I possibly can, um, fairly and working hard, building relationships, um, and try to, trying to tune out the narratives that are being formed. Um, I also think that there is way too much emphasis on cable news and the big national papers being the media um, when there's local outlets, regional outlets. Something that a comms team did with me recently, which actually don't, I don't know how my bosses would feel about this, but I said yes, was they offered me something as an exclusive and said, would you mind if we also gave it to, and it's literally the paper in Casper, Wyoming. And I was like, you know what? I don't see myself as a head-to-head competitor with whoever's covering politics at the paper in Casper, Wyoming. I'm fine. If they pop their story before mine, I'll link to it. Or we'll just, it's like, I don't see that as a problem. And I was very open to it. Never lie to a reporter and say you're given an exclusive and it's not. Um, but having that conversation. I was like, let's throw the Casper Wyoming paper a bone. Give them an exclusive from Capitol Hill that I'll also write on before the rest of the world has it. But if it's me and Casper, I'm good. Um, I also think that uh, something that gets a little lost on Capitol Hill is it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Members need to tout what they're accomplishing. Members need to tout what is needed back in their districts, even if what they're trying to accomplish isn't moving. They need to raise the issues that are um, problems in their district uh, or successes in their district. Um, And how do you get the word out about those? Yes, you have a constituent newsletter, but you also have the free press. Um, And The press also knows that we need to write stories to inform our readers about what's happening in Congress. Um, What I think we benefited from on Capitol Hill was that symbiotic relationship in the last few years when um, narratives about uh, the press being the enemy of the American people was on the rise. Um, And frankly, even lawmakers who would say that out loud would still say, hey, let me talk to you over here during a vote because they know that they want to talk to the press. So Um, switching over to some questions in the chat, we've gotten a few about graphic design. Um, Faith, I don't know. Do you have graphic design experience? Do you do that in your office? You want to chat to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, This is actually one of my pieces of advice. I was going to kind of go over with everyone, but um, because I, the first contract I worked for was very graphically design inclined, very digitally inclined. um, And I had no real, well, a little bit of graphic design experience, but definitely was not my strong suit. And I didn't realize how much was that was a valuable skill, especially if you're applying for these press assistant positions. If you guys are all interns right now wanting to work in comms, 
you know, you would try to be a staff assistant, then probably a press assistant, press secretary, comms director. And, you know, to get those entry level positions, you're not going to be right off the bat talking to reporters, right? That's only something you really gain with with experience and relationships and learning what to say. But the one thing you can start working on is learning how to make a graphic, is learning how to cut video, all of those things, because those are hard skills that comms directors who maybe don't have the time to do that kind of stuff, it's tedious, right? Like making a graphic, cutting video, it takes time. So they'll hire a press assistant. If you can position yourself to have those skills, it's extremely valuable. I know it's why I was hired in this office because our deputy chief, who also acts as our comms director, I'm the press secretary and I do media stuff, but I also do all of our digital, right? And she's like, I need someone who can do digital. Um, and that was kind of the role I filled in that office. So definitely position yourself to have those kind of um, digital skills, I think is extremely helpful. Um, you know, Canva is a great tool. It's free, right? Like train yourself and learn what looks good. I personally uh, kind of just taught myself on Adobe. If your office has an Adobe license, ask if you can use it. Ask if you can, you know, YouTube videos are free. I learned pretty much every single thing I know from watching YouTube videos in Adobe. Um, and I taught myself how to do all the graphic stuff that I do now. So I would say it's definitely um, an important skill to have when you're especially applying for press assistant roles. Because if you look at press assistant job descriptions, it's makes graphics, cuts, edits videos, all those things. And if you don't know how to do that, you know, maybe you have a comms director that's willing to teach you and that's great. But oftentimes they want someone who can kind of walk into that role and, you know, take it on and kind of take the initiative to teach themselves. And I'm, my motto has been fake it till you make it, right? Like I didn't know how to do graphic design. I got a staff assistant job and I started doing graphic design and here I am. So I would say run with that. I do not have any graphic design experience when I was starting out. Um, press and digital were very separate at that time. Uh, it's become more of an integrated thing now, just as, you know, digital has become so important. It's something that I wish I had. So I think you will encounter comms people who are more so press focused, but it's becoming rarer and, you know, key point on it's something I wish I had. So <laughs> um, if it's a, if it's something that you're able to pick up and add to your resume and excel in, I think it will always make you more desirable in the market, even if you don't want to stick with doing digital work for your entire career. Um, and I know we have about three minutes left. One of the questions in here is actually a question I have because my answer is I have not been able to figure it out. So I'd be interested if anyone else has. And it's about work-life balance in these careers. Um, I found that usually jobs like this are more of a lifestyle than a job. Um, and so um, for me, it's a comfort level with always having your phone on you. Yes, you can still go out and do things and see friends and take vacations. But the idea of being totally, totally offline is not always a luxury you have and figuring out how to do things on your phone or just the comfort level of just grabbing your laptop if you're going to be needing it um, and sort of building a life around work is something that, you know, I sort of had to teach myself how to do. I, I think that building skills within an office, like so, so that if you have to say like, look, I'm actually stepping on a plane right now to take some time off. Here's someone who should be able to help you. Um, they might not be able to do everything that Matt knows how to do, but they can at least kind of steer the ship a little bit. I think that um, is helpful so that you can have some differentiation. I also say I'm stepping into a doctor's appointment right now. I'll get back to you when I'm done. Um, news breaks. Um, and I know it is different. Like I need to cover it. You guys need to respond to it. Um, it is hard. It's a 24 hour news cycle. Um, I think it is about there's shifts that need to happen in the culture, largely on Capitol Hill about how to deal with this. Um, because I know people have like responded to my emails while on their honeymoon and I don't want them to do that. I'm not asking them to take away from their honeymoon. Um, but somehow their office has been set up so that they cannot be away. Um, and that is um, something I know the modernization committee is working on. Awesome. I was thinking about 60 seconds left. Richard, Faith, if you have any closing thoughts. Um, yeah, it's kind of a lifestyle. Um, I, I would say, I mean, your best bet to find that life work, ba life work balance is searching for that, that office, that lawmaker office or that employer that really values that. 
and that's part of their work culture. They do exist. My news organization, for example, does give us the weekends off. Now, unless like 9-11 style news breaks or the annual budget thing happens. Recess is your your life. Like I have run my life on a congressional schedule for 10 years and I have a lot of fun in August. Yeah. One last thought I have on that is definitely just echoing it's uh, your member office is like really, and that's one of the positive and negatives, right? There's 535 offices and they're all run differently. So um, it definitely depends on what your office is like, but I think just the nature of comms is like things happen and you have your work phone on you. And, you know, when you're in lunch, you're not as, you know, you're not as expected to be as responsive, right? But comms, that's just kind of how it goes. So I think if you're interested in comms, it's just something to kind of expect. Um, so thank you, Rachel, Catherine, and Dave. I thought this is a fun conversation. <laughs>